First of all, I'm glad and honored to meet you, Dr. Armstrong. Uh, I think it's been uh, it's been a while. We've been trying to to do this for a while now. I got sick once or twice, uh, but I was always excited for this meeting because uh, watching your content on social media, I just I just knew that something clicked. Like this is exactly the kind of um, topics that interest me uh, personally philosophical topics and I saw that you are more focusing on uh, ancient Greek philosophy right. and that's why I would love if we start by uh, you introducing yourself uh, who you are what you do for a living and what you majored in yeah great yes I am uh, Dr. John Armstrong I'm a professor of philosophy at Southern Virginia University which is located in the state of Virginia in the United States. Mm -hmm. And I teach the history of philosophy, especially ancient Greek and Roman philosophy, as well as some courses on ethics and political philosophy and early Chinese philosophy. Oh, okay. Uh, how how did you become so interested in, in philosophy in general? Why, why did you pick philosophy? What, what was the motivation behind it on a personal level? Right. As an undergraduate student, I didn't know what philosophy was when I started college, but I had friends who were talking about the philosophy classes they were taking, and I thought that the questions they were talking about sounded much more interesting than the kinds of questions I was addressing in my other courses. And I, So I started uh, taking philosophy classes, and I also have an interest in the ancient world. I like to try to get back to the origins of ideas. And so I started learning ancient Greek and have been uh, reading texts in ancient Greek now for more than 30 years. So um, I have dual interests. I have interests in the origins of ideas as well as in just philosophical arguments themselves. Okay, okay, okay. That's, that, that's absolutely uh, uh, fascinating. To, to me personally, because uh, this is this is how people get interested in philosophy. They hear some specific questions or the, the most uh, shocking thing that I, I've been through in philosophy is when you ask a question and you discover, oh, maybe that's not the right question. That's <laughs> I think philosophy is is one of the uh, few disciplines or uh, yeah, nowadays where if you ask the question, you start by analyzing the question first before dig digging dig into the answers and trying to find them out. This is where it's it's the first uh, discipline that challenged me right there, like on, on the basis of the question itself. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think it, clarifying one's questions is important. That's for sure. Definitely, definitely. Okay. So that brings us to the many, many questions that I would love to discuss with you, uh, beginning with the most, most general wide question. What is philosophy really? Like, what is it? And after that, we could move on to the question of why do we need it today? Because uh, I think most people, I was one of them. I, I just had this idea, okay, maybe philosophy is something interesting, but I don't know why it's not simply a form of overthinking stuff. You know, wh why do, why, what are philosophers actually bringing to the table nowadays more than just overthinking the problems of, uh, of um, science or thinking about, you know, absolute truths which are not attainable to us. What, what is philosophy, really? Well, I follow Socrates in his conception of philosophy, which is the pursuit of wisdom, wisdom understood as how to conduct one's life the best way that one can as a human being. So there are two dimensions to that. That is, you know, what what is wisdom? What is it knowledge of? But also the pursuit is important because for Socrates, pursuing something, pursuing knowledge or pursuing wisdom um, is done on the assumption that one does not possess it. So you, you only pursue things that you lack. 
So there's a skepticism about philosophy in its very nature. So skepticism in the ancient sense means you're searching, not fully knowing the answers. So the most important question for Socrates is, how does one live a good life as a human being? And he would ask people about that. What does it mean to be a good person? What does it mean to be a virtuous person, a just person, a courageous person? And he would ask people to define those things and he would test their definitions as you probably know. Um, but he was doing that in a search for uh, knowledge of how to live well himself and also how to help his fellow citizens live well. There's a political purpose to it for him. He wants to have his fellow citizens be virtuous and just people as well. He thinks their values are upside down. They often pursue money before they pursue virtue. And he thinks it should be the other way around, that it's being a virtuous person that makes your money good for you, right? If you're not a virtuous person, he thinks your money it could be bad for you because you don't know how to use it properly. Uh, and the definitely. same would go for, for fame and power as well. Definitely, definitely. Um, the ancient Greek, uh, um, those those guys, the, the, the big ones, the most uh, uh, popular ones uh, as in philosophy, as in, uh, in, in pop culture, when it comes to philosophical topics like Socrates, uh, Plato and Aristotle. Uh, well, it started with Socrates. On, on the basis of skepticism, like you said. And now I have a question that I learned about in one of my courses, and I just want to know your opinion about it. Um, when do we find the line where skepticism is not helpful anymore for us? Or who's who, who, who can say that? How can we determine, okay, now is skepticism going just too far? Now just we're just being skeptic of everything and everyone this is some people who who fear skepticism uh this is what they're afraid of that once they start they they they, they can't stop it anymore and everything would collapse their whole theory of the world would collapse inside their minds so is it is it really a process that once it gets started it cannot be stopped any any at any point uh yes it can be stopped um but let me first address the problem that I think you're raising, which gets pursued by somebody like Descartes when he doubts that he uh, knows anything at all, except that he must exist because he's doubting. And how could he not exist if he's doubting, right? So he yeah. thinks, therefore, he exists. So he tries to build on that bare minimum of knowledge up to a trust in the new science that had arisen during his day, which relies heavily upon sensory inputs and use of the, the senses. Um, but you're right. Um, today, you might say, how do we know that we're not um, somehow in an artificially generated reality that is being produced by who knows who, computer programmer, um, and maybe we're being projected back into the year 2024, but in fact, it's yeah. the year 2124, and we've signed up for a virtual experience in the past, but we've, we don't realize we've done that. How do we know that's not true? Exactly. Well, um, I think the, the answer to that is we don't know that's not true, right? And there, you can always, that's always a possibility, but, um, that doesn't bother me very much because the way skepticism stops is that we have to make decisions about what to do in life. We have to feed ourselves. We have to get a job. You know, we have to go to school. There are decisions that we make, and we have to make those decisions on the information that we have available to us. Is it possible that our information is faulty? Yes, it's possible. But the practical situation is that we have to make decisions in life. And so we have to use the best information we can. So philosophy, the pursuit of wisdom, means I'm pursuing the best understanding I can so that I can live the best life I can. 
And whether this life is a virtual life or a life that's lived in an actual external world, I still have to make my decisions and use my judgment about the information that I'm basing my decisions on. Okay, uh, so that means that this line where we can say, okay, now we we have too much skepticism, this line is not a theoretical uh, line or an analytical line that we can find now just by thinking. Uh, it's rather a practical thing. It's a, it's a, it's a practical thing depending on how much we know in each situation and how much we need to know in any situation. Because if we really uh, need to calculate every situation to its fullest, we may never come to the point where we actually do something. We will always lack some kind of information or calculation in our decision making. But nonetheless, we have to come to a point where we're like, okay, now I have almost enough information to base my trust on this decision this decision and after i've made it i can reevaluate my calculation so philosophy is important in 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 uh, in, in the pursuit of knowledge and uh, good decision making right decision making but at the same time we need this practical uh, practical discipline. We need to, to engage in life in order to find that out. Very interesting. So why do we need philosophy at all? Well, philosophy teaches us to, it's the skeptical element that I like. like it teaches us to suspend judgment uh, and not, it, it teaches us a kind of intellectual humility and part of that intellectual humility is not, you know, we're not supposed to think we know things we don't know. And we can uh, deceive ourselves into thinking we things, thinking that we know things that we don't when we use our concepts imprecisely, or, um, you know, we, we just rely on the crowd's opinions about things to form our own opinions. So it pushes us to um, test the beliefs that are handed to us by our culture and, you know, examine them for their truth and their goodness. So why do we need, that's, that's the philosophical attitude. And if one, do, if one isn't like that, then one is too hasty in one's judgments. And one thinks one knows what one probably does not know. And, for, you know, for Socrates, that was a big mistake. And he really didn't like politicians trying to rule the society who really didn't understand what was good for the society and hadn't thought about it. They just wanted to assert themselves in their society. And he thought that was a big mistake. Uh, what I understand from uh, from what you said, like if I try to put it in my, wor in my words, uh, it comes down to two things. Uh, first of all, it's it's about clarity. Uh, philosoph philosophy in general provides a, a, a kind of clarity that we don't have otherwise because it's mostly concerned with the actual meaning and implications of what we already know. So if we have a bunch of informations laying in front of us, uh, what, what do this information, what does everything we know this far tell us about 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 our lives tell us about uh, how we should live about what we actually might uh, imply what, what what does it imply actually so it's uh, it's a more of an analytic uh, discipline in in my view as much as i understand it uh, today i think uh, what was his name slavoj Žižek, the, the the famous philosopher nowadays he said it once he said that when talking for example about freedom philosophy philosophy is not about asking the questions are we free or not it's more about asking the question what does it mean to be free at the end of the day so it's more about what 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 do our words actually mean what does our knowledge actually uh, imply at the end of the day and that provides us uh, with more clarity why do we need philosophy because we have these kinds of minds that do not see 
the implications of what we know to its full extent just by looking at it. I think maybe a, a being like God who sees the implications of everything would, ne would never be interested in philosophy or mathematics or logic because God sees the implications of, of, of its statement, statements right from the beginning. It doesn't need to do this kind of calculation. Do you, do, did you agree with that? Um, yeah, it depends on what one thinks the relation is between God and say the future. You know, mm -hmm. if, if, if has one has a conception of God, like St. Augustine, where God is outside of time, then God doesn't need to predict the future. He just sees it like it's right in front of him. And so, as you said, he can know the whole of reality, including the whole of the physical universe, its past, present, and future, as if it's right in front of him. On the other hand, if you think that the that God is somehow part of the flow of the universe, um, then maybe God's knowledge of the future is not just a matter of seeing it, but matter a matter of observing the past patterns of the universe and then predicting how things will go. Um, so I think one sees this kind of conception of a God that's in the universe in the Stoics, for example, where they see God as reason that works with matter to create the world as it's unfolding. And it's God is not a something that's outside of the world, but is inside the world that's helping it is, unfold. Is that Spinoza's God or is Spinoza's God something different from that? Um, I am not an expert on Spinoza. Um, it's possible Spinoza was influenced by the Stoics, mm -hmm. um, but the Stoics think of God as logos, this is the Greek word, as penetrating the material world and making it unfold in a certain way. And it's it's some it's somewhat like Plato's conception in his dialogue called the Timaeus, except there God is a creator being that's using the material uh, that's available, which by its own nature is chaotic and tends towards disorder and tries to bring order to it on the basis of his understanding of what the properly ordered world should be like. But, but the world, that the world. separates God from the world. And in, in, in that, in that, uh, in this idea, we see God separated from the world as he, as he or it tries to, to 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 reform it in some kind of way. If I understand correctly, yeah, the time the the Platonic picture in the Timaeus does have God somehow outside the world, but still playing this creative role in trying to introduce intelligent movement to the world through the world soul is what it's called. And um, I'm unsure if that's just like what Augustine was talking about, where, you know, for Augustine, God is like the form of the good and is outside of time and space. But the Timaeus God is intelligence. And I think the characterization of God there, in my opinion, is as a force that is bringing intelligent order to the world. And that might be in the world um, somehow, mm -hmm. too, as the intelligence so, of the world soul. Is this also your, uh, your, your view of God? Or how, how do you see God? Is there a difference between your view of, of God and what God is in philosophy? Uh, yes, I'm... Uh, I'm a religious person. I belong to a church called the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and I think of God as a perfect human, like a perfect uh, uh, man. And um, and so God is wise, good, virtuous, um, um, but God also has a power in one of our scriptures similar to what the Stoics talked about, except instead of it being called reason, it's called light. And light penetrates everything and makes things move in an orderly way, not just um, in things that are alive like animals, but in the cosmos at a, on a large scale. So on the one hand, um, 
my religious conception of God is different from the philosophers in that I, I think of God as a perfect uh, person like us, except much better. But um, on the other hand, there's this philosophical element that's also in our scriptures about God ordering the world in the way the Stoic reason does. Okay, okay. Um, very, very interesting. I was really interested in knowing if there is a difference between, like, if when, when you go in a philosophy lecture or if you sit and you think, okay, now I am uh, conducting philosophy right now. Uh, do you uh, go about the topic of God differently from what, if you do it like on a daily basis or in church? That was uh, that was what what interested me. Uh, moving on, I want to know uh, a little bit uh, about knowledge from everything you know and learned in philosophy. What is knowledge? And specifically, I think the the first really distinct uh, definition of of knowledge actually emerged uh, in, in the times of the ancient Greek, um, as far as um, I can remember. Uh, what, is, what is knowledge? Well, um, yeah, I'll talk about the ancient Greek development of the notion, but also give you a, a commonly used contemporary definition, which is similar, and that it's, it's a belief that's true, but that is also justified. You've probably heard that before. Justified, Justified true, true belief. belief. Yeah. Now, when people say that, they are usually talking about a belief about a proposition, such as, you know, the if I say the pen is in my hand, that's a proposition. And it's true right now that the pen is in my hand. But right now, it's false that the pen is in my hand. So if I said right now, I know the pen is in my hand, I'm saying something false because I don't know, I, I couldn't know that because it's false, right? Yeah. Um, now, my justification for believing it is that I can feel the pen in my hand and I can see it. So I have a justified belief that the pen is in my hand and that it's true. Now, that definition, justified true belief, has an echo in Plato's dialogues called the Mino, where Socrates contrasts somebody who has a belief about how to get to a city in northern Greece called Larissa with somebody who has traveled the road themselves. Both of them have a belief about the road, but one of them is an expert on the road, right? an expert about how to travel this road. The person who's been told how to get to Larissa, but who hasn't traveled the road, has a belief, it could well be true, and we could say it's justified because they've been told how to get there by a reliable person. But that doesn't count as knowledge in the Mino, because knowledge for Socrates there means you're an expert on how to get there. So justified true belief doesn't quite cut it as a definition of knowledge for Socrates. You, so he thinks of knowledge as expertise. So you really know something when you're an expert in the subject, such as how to get to a certain location or how to build a house or how to build a ship or how to win a battle or, you know, any number of things. But they're, they're often practical questions about how to do something. So if you're an expert on that, then you could be said to have episteme. Um, and that's different than just having a belief that you might hold for a good reason but it's not a reason that's as strong as the reasons that the expert has for his or her beliefs. Very interesting because while while I'm listening to you, I I, I thought to myself I might come to maybe a similar but but nonetheless a little bit different conclusion than than Socrates. Uh, the what I think is that okay, if if he defines true knowledge as okay uh, as something of um, what do you say expertise as having being an expert in something, then I would just say being an expert is in in something is the true justification for 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 believing in in that you can do it or that you know it. 
So I, I wouldn't throw the whole definition away. I would just place the role of the expertise inside the meaning of justification, of it being a good enough justification for believing that. Um, that that would be a high standard. You know, if if I understand you correctly, would you are saying that you are not justified in believing something unless you're an expert. Is that what you're saying? Uh, from 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 Socrates' point of view, I be- yeah. I personally don't believe that. I just think if Socrates is seeing it like that, I would uh, personally not in his in his place. So if I would agree with Socrates on uh, on the topic of expertise being the basis of true true knowledge, then I would not throw away this whole definition of justified true belief, I would just place the expertise inside the justification. But I personally do not believe that because like you said, it is actually a very, very high standard that most people uh, cannot aspire to. And today we have other means of justifications. I think I think inside of the word justification, the whole uh, system of science might, might rely today or uh, new kinds of evidence might rely today. N- new ways of proving that your belief is actually justified. I wouldn't go to the point of expertise, but I don't think that Socrates' point of view throws out the whole the whole uh, definition. It would just place the point of expertise inside the justification. Maybe I'm missing something out. I don't no, know. No, I, I, I think that the question is, what is knowledge? And for mm-hmm. Socrates, you need to be an expert to have knowledge because episteme suggests expertise. If we were to ask him, does that mean that if I, if my friend told me how to get to Larissa, that I don't have any justification for how to, in believing I know the road to Larissa? He said, well, no, I think he would say, well, yeah, you have a reason to believe it and it's a good reason to believe it but it doesn't rise to the level of expertise. And so we wouldn't okay. use the word episteme for it. It's a belief okay. that has a reason to back it up, but it's not a reason that's as strong as the kind that a, you know, a firsthand uh, a, you know, experience of the road would give you. I think that when, 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 when we face someone like Socrates, who's the father of skepticism, we would kind of um, expect such a high standard for using the word episteme from from him okay uh, it, it it makes it makes sense it makes sense uh okay moving on from moving from god to morality what is morality itself and is god the source of morality i think there is a video that we that you made once on uh, on on instagram and we went back and forth in the in the in the comment section it was very interesting so um yeah, I um, think that what is just for human beings and the proper way that we should live together, which I think is what morality is about, um, is um, sort of is what it is, and is not determined just by what you know anybody says, including God. In other words, I think that what justice is is something that we humans should um, learn about and follow and that God knows about it and follows it, but doesn't make it up. Um, Oh, okay, okay, okay. This is similar to what's called the Euthyphro dilemma, which you might have heard about. There's a conversation Socrates has with a, a young man who thinks he knows all about religion and God. And he asks him, well, what does it mean to be pious? What does it mean to be holy? And he says, well, what holiness is, is whatever the gods love. And Socrates says, okay, but do the gods love holy things because they're holy? Or are those things holy because God loves them? And he says, I don't quite understand what you're saying. And, but I think you understand what he's saying, right? Yes. So is, is it the fact that God likes something that makes something good or just or holy, 
Or does God like things because they are just or good or holy? And Socrates... That justice and holiness is something that is outside of God. God is not defining what is holy and just. It's rather that God loves what's holy and just. Right, right. So um, Plato in the Republic uses this point to argue that traditional stories in Greek myth about gods are inappropriate because they have the gods doing things that are unjust. And he says, you should not say, you should not tell such stories about the gods. So in this, in the Republic, he says, in this city we're developing, the poets won't be allowed to tell those stories because the people in our city shouldn't think that the gods are capable of doing things that are unjust, right? That they, they're, they're always doing things that are just. So, um, so I don't want to suggest that God is unjust. Rather, the, the philosophical point is what justice is, is not defined by God. Um, so, but God is just, but that doesn't mean that God sort of justice is whatever God says it is, you know. God is just per definition, but it he is not the source of justice, if I understand it correctly. Yeah, yeah he doesn't he doesn't just create it um yeah. according to whatever you know he happens to say. So if, if God were to say that, you know, murder is just, then God would be wrong, right? That would so God, exactly. would, God would not say such a thing. But God, God by definition, is the, the, the being that would not say that because it's unjust. Right, because God is virtuous. Yeah. The point we just talked about uh, in discussing uh, God and morality and how morality and justice lies, it, it's, not, it's, it, it's not being defined by God, but rather God follows them because per, uh, because by definition he is god is the being that is always just and always moral um when when you talked about that in one of your videos uh i i i responded in in the comment section by saying okay it's very interesting but it raises actually the question that if god is always bound to to, to do the right thing, the just thing, the moral thing. Where is God's freedom? Where is God's free will? And uh, your point, what, when we when we talked, you answered with something that was very uh, interesting. You uh, distinguished two different kinds of uh, freedom. You said. Uh, it seems better to uh, it seems better to think of freedom as an ability to act in accordance with one's judgments. You said that there are two kinds of uh, freedom. The first kind is the freedom to formulate one's judgment, and the other kind is to act in accordance with that judgment. So, uh, and and you said that uh, I think you talked about David Hume being. Uh, one of the philosophers who focused on the on the second one, which is liberty in its practical meaning, um, where on the other hand you 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 you're more interested in the first kind. So, how is God free in that sense? That's what I want to understand. Um, well, if God is making it, if God is a perfect being and deciding what to do, apparently God knows what is going to be best to do. And when God formulates his judgment about what to do, it's going to be the right thing and, and is not going to want to do something other than what's best. Mm -hmm. um, but um, perhaps on the ground needs to decide what's going to be best and how to deal with a particular person or uh, deal with a particular civilization or whatever it is, that, or, or a particular planet or whatever God is thinking about. Yeah. Um, so is your question, is it possible for God to entertain thoughts about what is not the best thing to do? 
That's that's exactly my question. Um, I would think the answer is yes, it's possible. Mm -hmm. um, and in that sense, um, I, uh, I differ from Kant, who says that God's will necessarily complies with what is objectively required by morality um, or by justice or what have you. Um, in other words, the nature of God's will as a holy will is one that is different from the nature of human wills. Human wills can deviate from what's right, but God's will is fundamentally different. It cannot possibly deviate from what's right. And I think, well, that is in a, that's a certain conception of an ideal will, but um, I just think that we humans are are also familiar with getting ourselves in a position where we have no thoughts of doing something wrong in a particular area. You know, for example, like I have no desire whatsoever to smoke cigarettes, right? Now, there might have been a time in my youth where I thought smoking cigarettes looks kind of cool. I wonder what that would be like, right? But now, you know, as a middle-aged man, I don't, I don't think that at all. I don't, I have no desire whatsoever. So if I can do that, why can't God do that? You know, yeah. Is it, yeah. is it possible for me to think of what it would be like to smoke about smoke a cigarette? Sure. It's possible, but I do, I wouldn't do it. You know, like I have no desire. I can think about the possibility, but have no, you know, real desire to, to do it. Does that mean I have a bad will because I can think about the possibility? I don't think so, you know, because I have it's not a bad will. But uh, and and here comes a point uh, that's very important to me that you just raised. Uh, that kind of perfect will in 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 in, in my uh, from my point of view that Kant raises. I don't know whether there is any place left for freedom in itself if god uh, has a perfect will which which makes his will basically determined by what's good and what's bad he cannot even comprehend or think about a possibility of 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 the wrong thing going if it's only like one equals one and that's it the right thing equals the thing that can be even thought, then I think that eliminates any kind of 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 uh, freedom from from God itself. I don't know. Yeah, um, I think part of this is complicated by whether we think God has to do anything, because if you have to do something it seems like you have to make a decision about what you're going to do. Mm -hmm. But to make a decision means that you're kind of thinking about possible courses of action and, and whether, to under, whether to undertake them. And I wonder if Kant thinks that God makes any decisions at all, you know? Because uh, you might say that on a, on a certain conception of God that maybe um, was had by certain early Christians, um, maybe by some in the Islamic tradition that were influenced by certain interpretations of Plato and Aristotle, that God doesn't do anything because all God, God is pure activity and there's no uh, potentiality about it. And so outside of time and space, because you have to be outside of time because time implies change. And of course, with God, there's no change. So you have to be outside of time. Well, if, you, if you're a being, that's like being like the number three, you know, like the number three might exist outside of time and space and doesn't ever change, but it also doesn't do anything, you know? So yeah. if, you, if you think that God doesn't do anything, then freedom isn't even a question, you know, because you don't, what That's does it true. mean? What does it mean to be free if you don't undertake any actions whatsoever? But if you are a being that is an agent and you have to do things, then freedom becomes an issue 
because it's implied by deliberation about your decisions. As Kant says, anytime you deliberate, you assume you are free. It's it's implied because when you deliberate, you're thinking about alternative courses of action. Thank you for clarifying that. That that, that was actually very helpful. Um, now we come to the last uh, question, which is uh, personally very very important to me. What does it mean for us human beings to be free? Um, well, two senses. You know, as I said, freedom is the ability to entertain possibilities and say yes or no to them. Um, but in the human sense, which is also relevant, freedom is the ability to enact your will. So if you um, decide to do something, but you can't do it because you're being prevented, you know, because you're in jail or you don't have the resources, uh, maybe you thought you could do it, but you end up not realizing you don't have the resources, that's relevant to human freedom. So when we're talking about political freedom and being able to act in the world, it's not just important that we have free will in the sense of being able to make a decision for ourselves. It's also important that we be able to enact our will. So I don't, I don't think Hume is completely wrong in defining liberty as the ability to enact your will. I just think that he's wrong in, in pulling our attention away from the importance of deliberation and weighing reasons and making decisions because he talks as if our character just kind of determines what decisions we're going to make and our character is formed by our upbringing and our environment and our past and past events. I think, yes, of course, we're influenced by our past events, but every time we make a decision, we are, we do have to weigh reasons and entertain different possibilities. And in that, in that way, we are assuming that we are free. And if we are not free, then that deliberation is just an illusion, right? We are not really deliberating. We're just alternating between different desires. And then mm -hmm. somehow the most dominant desire manifests itself. You know, you don't really I think, I think what you just I think what you just described is actually the stance of uh, compatibilism on the subject of free will itself, where they say, OK, we might actually live in a determined uh world nonetheless we humans have or they define they define free will in terms of degrees of freedom it's like okay if you have an arm an arm has three joints which means you have three de degrees of freedom and the same applies for your mind you have you have uh, many and, and and different uh mental capabilities that allow you to to reason that allow you to weigh uh your your decisions and choices and based on that you can make a decision and based on that you can be even held responsible for your decisions because if you don't have those degrees of freedom if you don't have the ability to reason then uh even in practical sense in 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 in, in our justice system you might not be held responsible for some of your mistakes if we can prove that you are not free or you are not reasonable enough you don't have that ability and those mind tools to to take to, such a responsibility to actually make such a decision um i would not characterize myself as a compatibilist because the compatibilist believes that determinism is true mm -hmm. and um i can accept all of what you just said about having the ability to reason but for me, the ability to reason means being able to weigh different reasons for different courses of action and decide for yourself which you think is best. And in that activity, you assume you are free. Now, if compatibilism is true, then that assumption is false mm -hmm. because you are being made to make the decision that you're making by whatever forces are at work in your psychology. But I don't think we have to assume that. I think that that assumption is very controversial and might well be false based on, you know, it assumes an understanding of the physical universe and, you know, a mechanistic universe that could well be false. You know, 
I'm not yeah. an expert in quantum mechanics, but the the level of activity going on at the quantum level might not be quite what Newton thought it was, you know, and and if it's not, then why assume determinism? You know, it, yeah, yeah. So I, I understand. I, I just, um, you know, our physical theories are going to continue to evolve, and they're going to, you know, discover new forces, and that our physicists are going to invent new terms for them, and and they're going to try to figure out different form mathematical formulations for how to express it. And am I supposed to suspend judgment in the meantime about whether I'm free? How could I do that? You know. Yeah, yeah. I think the the most satisfying uh, definition or talk about freedom uh, that uh, satisfied me personally was uh, uh, who was it? Yuval Noah Harari and and Slavoj Žižek actually who mentioned that they said that um, the closest we can get to freedom is in not knowing whether we are free or not as in this 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 uh, state of not being 100% sure whether you're free or not this is the maximum amount of freedom that you can get and this is where actual freedom lies in not actually knowing and thinking i might be free i should make decisions for for the sake of 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 being a free uh, agent i i don't want to make some decisions that are uh, that that are wrong and later on discover that i'm actually free i was actually free to make the right decision i should assume that i am free and in in not act in not absolutely knowing whether i'm i'm free or not this is where true freedom lies from their perspective um true freedom lies in not knowing whether i'm free um, mm -hmm. Well, I would say true freedom lies in the ability to uh, act on a reason that you judge is the best reason. Um, and if you can't, if you can't do that, then you're not free. Okay. And that's kind of what you were referring to earlier as the ability to reason. I think. Yes, exactly, exactly. Uh, what what I just talked about was uh, from a subjective point of view. I was not talking objectively whether you're actually able or not. It's uh, from a subjective point of view. What does it mean? What does it feel like to be free? The feeling of being free, the closest you can get to the feeling is the not knowing whether you're free or not. This is what they meant. Mm -hmm. it's, it's about the feeling, not the actual definition of, of, of freedom itself. But okay, it's, uh, it was just a, a, a point that I wanted our listeners to to have heard at least once in their lives. Uh, Dr. Armstrong, thank you very, very much for this meeting, uh, for agreeing to, 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 to this uh, um, very interesting and very, very, very helpful uh, discussion. Thank you, Suleiman. It's been my pleasure to talk with you. And I hope maybe in the future we can, we can have a second, a third round maybe, if we if we dig deeper and deeper into some some topics, we we definitely will find some topics that interest us more both, and we can talk about them more. Thank you very much. All right, sounds good.